two billion dollars. That's how much a California jury's awarded a cancer-stricken couple that used Roundup extensively. It's the third major ruling in a row against Roundup's maker, Monsanto, with dozens of other lawsuits slated. What next uh, for the weed killers? A new parent company, German agrochemical giant Bayer. Truth is, Roundup and its active ingredient glyphosate are ubiquitous. The weed killer of choice for small homeowners and big farmers alike. It's been so for decades. Europe's just given glyphosate a five-year extension. Its regulators don't agree with the World Health Organization and its findings. Uh, with, uh, the uh, EU, which has uh, so far refused to formally certify the link between Roundup and cancer. What does the science really say? And can we trust our sources? Investigative journalists point to heavy lobbying, not only among lawmakers, but even in the lab. Bayer has now apologized in the wake of revelations that Monsanto kept an illegal friends of glyphosate and enemies of glyphosate secret listing. That begs the broader question. To what extent do corporate interests and uh, dictate public policy? Today in the France 24 debate, could glyphosate be a ticking a time bomb? Uh, we invited uh, Bayer, we invited Monsanto to join us. They did not honor our request. But we do have with us from Brussels, François Veilreit, president of the French environmental advocacy group Génération Future. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thanks, you. Also from the European capital, Nina Holland, researcher Thank at the Corporate uh, Europe Advo Observatory, which advocates against undue lobbying. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, you've seen her reporting on this issue in such outlets as The Guardian newspaper from Kansas City investigative journalist Carrie Gillum, the author of the book Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer and the corruption of science. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And from Madison, Wisconsin, Kevin Senapathy, contributing editor at SciMoms.com. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Now, that $2 billion sum may shrink once the appeals have been lodged. Still, it's enough to catch the whole world's attention. Solange Mougin has more. This California couple has been battling cancer for nine years, and they were just awarded over $2 billion in damages against Monsanto, the maker of the weed killer Roundup that they believe gave them lymphoma. We wish that Monsanto had warned us ahead of time about the dangers of using Monsanto. Monsanto is now owned by Bayer, and they say they plan to appeal and they maintain that glyphosate, an ingredient in Roundup, is safe for human use. This is the third time since August that a U.S. court has awarded hefty damages against the company. By far the largest penalty, lawyers agree it's likely to be reduced on appeal. But for Alva and Alberta Pilliad and their lawyers, the sum of $1 billion per plaintiff sends an important message. They paid $63 billion to buy Monsanto, and by they I mean Bayer. They have the resources to pay for this case and the tens of thousands of other people out there who have cancer. Thousands of lawsuits are in the works, with a total of some 13,000 plaintiffs in the U.S. alone. Trouble is also brewing in Europe against the makers of the world's most used weed killer. After it emerged that Monsanto had kept lists of politicians and scientists in France who were for or against them. Shady lobbying tactics that were also discussed at trial, as Monsanto documents emerged that they bullied scientists to tout glyphosate's purported safety. Still approved by the EPA and the European Chemicals Agency, glyphosate remains on the market and in use. Despite widespread fears, it causes cancer. Yeah, the, as uh, you heard Solange Mougin explain, uh, Roundup and glyphosate, its active ingredients, still legal both uh, in Europe and in the United States, uh, where the Environmental Protection Agency put out a press release last month saying if we're going to feed 10 billion people by 2050, that's a quote of the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, we're going to need all the tools at our disposal, which include glyphosate. Uh, 
You had the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture applauds the Environmental Protection Agency's proposed registration decision as it is science-based and consistent with the findings of other regulatory authorities that glyphosate does not pose a carcinogenic hazard to humans. Carrie Gillum, your reaction. Uh, my reaction to the EPA report, uh, it, it's not really very surprising at all. The EPA has uh, followed Monsanto's lead on how to look at glyphosate science, uh, you know, for, for 40 years, essentially. Um, evidence that came out at trial shows us that, and, and, and laid out in my book, shows us that dating back into, you know, the very early 1980s, late 70s and early 80s, uh, there were studies and information indicating a carcinogenic link to glyphosate. Um, you know, we've had additional studies throughout the years that have been done by independent scientists showing an array of concerns uh, tied to glyphosate. But importantly, um, people need to understand that glyphosate is not used or sold by itself. And the trials were not about glyphosate per se, but they were about Roundup and other formulated products that Monsanto uh, manufactures and, and, and distributes. Uh, the EPA uh, never has done any long-term testing or required any long-term testing or Roundup and the other formulations. Uh, and, that, and that's a very important thing that many people don't understand. Why haven't they done so? It's not required. Uh, the EPA and, and regulators around the world really only require long-term testing on the active ingredient in these in these uh, pesticides that are used uh, in farming and, and in other applications. So it just hasn't been required. And Monsanto admitted uh, at trial and has acknowledged that it's never done these these long-term toxicity testing. Um, and in fact, our our national toxicology program here in the United States just in 2016 finally decided in conjunction with the EPA because of all of the controversy, finally decided that they would do toxicity testing on the formulations. You know, this was only three years ago. Um, this thing has been on the market, this product has been on the market for more than 40 years. Uh, I think it's, it's noteworthy um, that Monsanto and the chemical industry did not want that testing. They did not want the National Toxicology Program to, to do that, and they complained and tried to get that, uh, that review stopped. Uh, we know that from the initial testing so far that I reported in The Guardian, the National Toxicology Program has confirmed that glyphosate formulations uh, like Roundup and other products are much more toxic than glyphosate is by itself. And that just underscores, again, the decades of science from independent scientists around the world who, who have been telling us that, uh, that these mm. formulations, glyphosate with the surfactants like POEA, which has been banned in Europe, uh, that these are particularly uh, harmful um, and look like they can be carcinogenic to humans. As Carrie was mentioning, last month, a U.S. federal agency that's part of the Department of Health and Human Services issuing a draft report that points to a cancer risk. Bloomberg quotes a senior scientist with the National Resources Defense Council, that's an environmental advocacy group, who says, quote, the risks would have been found to be greater had they been given sufficient weight to more realistic studies of people and test animals exposed to the full product, not just one single chemical in Roundup. Uh, Kevin Senapathy, why hasn't there been full testing of Roundup and we could that way lift the doubts? Well, I'd like to speak to a couple points here regarding glyphosate and Roundup and Monsanto. Um, usually the answers aren't as neat as Monsanto has been covering everything up and this thing isn't safe at all, or that Monsanto has been totally transparent and glyphosate and Roundup are safe. Uh, Monsanto has certainly acted in ways that um, do not uh, help the public feel trust in them, nor should they. But the thing with glyphosate is, um, to the question of whether or not it should be banned, I'm not going to say that it shouldn't be banned. Um, I'm also going to speak to the point that um, without glyphosate, there's this idea that we won't be able to feed the world's growing population. 
I disagree with that. I, um, from all of the literature that I've read, and, you, and listen, you can't just read the literature at face value. You have to kind of understand and speak to experts about um, why something might be categorized as carcinogenic. When the International Agency of Research on Cancer um, categorizes glyphosate as probably carcinogenic, that's in the same category of tons of other stuff that we're exposed to, um, including sunlight, including working odd shifts. But um, if glyphosate was banned, one thing that I'm hearing more and more experts agree is that glyphosate is a safe, uh, relatively safe com compared to other pesticides that are being used um, and herbicides that were being used before, uh, before glyphosate. Um, if we banned it, glyphosate uh, would no longer be in the hands of farmers who use it. So they would have to come up with another way to control weeds. And that could potentially lead to um, increased prices when it comes to farming, at least in the, in the short term or immediately. Um, but again, we have to weigh the question of banning glyphosate with whether or not the alternatives are going to be safe or less safe. And that's, that's questionable. And questionable. And it, it, the point you make is the one that's made by the big uh, French farm lobby uh, union, the FNSEA, uh, François Veillerette. Uh, a lot of French farmers say uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to drop glyphosate, but what's the alternative? Is there one? Yes, of there, course, there, there will always be an alternative. There was an alternative before. There was Fra François Veyret. François Veyret. Yes, the, the French uh, Institute for Agronomic Research published a report in a, month, a couple of months ago, and they were clear that alternatives already exist in more than 80% of all the situations. And of course, Effective alternatives? as you know, organic farmers don't use uh, glyphosate. So it's, uh, they are efficient. Uh, the problem is they are a little more costly, and uh, French farmers are reluctant to, to use them. But uh, this is not the point. In the EU, as you may know, you can't sell a pesticide uh, whose active substance is uh, a recognized or a probable carcinogen, which is the case of glyphosate, and it shouldn't have been authorized in the first place, which is a problem now, as you know, because we have this a big expert report by IARC here, uh, which shows that uh, we have a certainty that it is carcinogenous for animals, and we have enough epidemiological data to show that it has an effect on people. You know, uh, a, a meta review was published a few weeks ago showing that the increase of risk for uh, glyphosate uh, users is plus 41% compared to people not using glyphosate, so it's time now to ban it, and the alternatives are out there. Uh, to, to be used. And are those alternatives ready? That's the question that French farmers want to know. Yeah, they are ready in most situations and maybe in a few situations uh, regarding the system of culture. Uh, they can be improved. Some things need to be developed, obviously. So we also ask the you know, the authorities to, give, to put money in research to develop or to improve a few alternatives. But as you know, the French state has planned to get out of glyphosate in three years' time. So it's, we have enough time to improve all these methods, but still, in more than 80% of the cases, they do exist already. So let's not wait for further lymphoma to develop and let's protect the environment and human health but by implementing these alternatives right now. Nina Holland, I want to get back to something Carrie Gillum said at the outset, which was that the testing that's been done has been on one specific chemical, not so much on the product as a whole, in this case, Roundup, which is the name of that weed killer. It's, exactly. rem it's reminiscent, isn't it, of uh, the diesel's emission scandal that we've seen in Europe, where they did the testing, but it wasn't the testing as it would be in real life. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's a very good comparison. Um, what shows the what the experience shows in Brussels is that if you uh, want to do effective lobbying, 
uh, you have to start as early as possible in the process. So that means that you have to have influence over the methodologies and the ways that our products are being tested before they get to the market. So that is, uh, that is really key. And uh, therefore, it's very strange that the companies can choose uh, what is the active ingredient in a product and then actually sell an entire formulation that contains many more um, and, and just to be clear on this point, it's the same in Europe as it is in the United States? It's the same in Europe. So the, the, the national member states of the EU, they, um, they do the authorization of the formulated products like Roundup and all the other formulations, but they also don't do the long-term testing. So it's the EU that is doing uh, the, the, the authorization of the active ingredient. And uh, many studies show that the active ingredient glyphosate uh, is toxic, uh, is probably carcinogenic on its own, but uh, the formulation Roundup and all the other formulations uh, are much more toxic. Uh, or have never been uh, tested for their long-term impacts. M so much that is, more toxic, uh, it, you say? What really uh, the, the Monsanto papers, the formulations, so Roundup and uh, all the other products that contain glyphosate, all the glyphosate-based herbicides, as we call it. There are many more uh, producers of glyphosate that are united in Europe in the glyphosate task force that is being run by uh, a lobby firm called Hume Brophy. And they have collectively tried to get the, the reauthorization for, uh, for glyphosate in the EU. And for them, this, the, the system to get the, this new permit for 15 years, they only got five now, but uh, th this whole process uh, has been shown to be captured in industry's interest in, in their benefit. They can actually write the first uh, report. They have ample opportunity to, to dismiss uh, independent studies. Uh, and what has also been shown is that the EU agencies actually largely copy and paste from the industry's report. So these are some of the fundamental flaws in, uh, in our system of, of uh, authorizing pesticides for the EU market. Yeah, regulation uh, is at the core of this conversation. Stay with us. More to come. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Uh, we're speaking on the heels of a, a $2 billion ruling in favor of two cancer-stricken patients in California against Monsanto and its ubiquitous uh, weed killer Roundup. Its active ingredient glyphosate uh, is under pressure these past years. There's growing pressure. There are going to be demonstrations throughout Europe against it this coming weekend. Joining us, François Veyrette. Uh, of the uh, environmental advocacy group Génération Future. Also joining us from Brussels, Nina Holland of uh, the Corporate Europe Observatory in Kansas City. Carrie Gillum, the author of the book Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption of science. And from Madison, Wisconsin, Kevin Senapathy, contributing editor to SciMoms.com. Uh, Welcome back uh, to all of you. Yeah, we mentioned it just briefly before the break. Uh, we saw it come out in 2017, leaked documents. Uh, it was called the Monsanto Papers. Investigative journalists working on those uh, leaks point to a 2015 email, for instance, sent by Monsanto's Eric Sachs to scientist Henry Miller, of the Hoover Institute. If you read the email, it says in it, are you interested in writing a column on this topic? Ideally, uh, your article would precede uh, a decision on, uh, on uh, glyphosate. Why not uh, set the table with the weight of scientific evidence? Then, regardless of what they do, your article will set the stage for a science-based response. And that article, while well, it later appeared uh, almost verbatim in, uh, uh, the, on the website of Forbes magazine. It's since been, uh, been taken down. Kevin Senapati, uh, you were mentioning to us in part one of our discussion how important it is to check your sources when you're uh, uh, talking about this issue. Since the Monsanto papers, what's been your view on, well, the information we have out there? Well, it's really interesting because Henry Miller, who you mentioned um, in the the email exchange, uh, I I've co-written a few articles with him at Forbes um, 
in particular, five of them. And those five or six of my articles that were co-authored with Henry Miller were um, taken down as well as all the rest of his work on Forbes. And I can understand why. Um, I, again, I've, I've written for a number of outlets, including Forbes. Uh, plenty of my work is still there that you can read um, about the relative safely, safety, excuse me, of glyphosate, among many other topics that I, I write about. Um, but to your question about uh, your sources, we have to be careful about how we interpret all of our sources, including um, IARC, the International Agency um, for Research on Cancer. But yeah, absolutely, Monsanto um, and, and others kind of in cahoots with them have not acted in totally uh, in, in transparency a lot of the time. And I do think that sometimes their messaging about issues like glyphosate, about genetic engineering, um, tend to be very one-sided. And it raises an interesting question and an important question about, number one, again, we, we talked about this earlier, but weighing um, weighing any specific tool like glyphosate and the alternative tools. Um, but also just treating these issues with the nuance they deserve. Again, um, I can't comment on the verdict in this case, but glyphosate, um, all for, with all of the research I've looked at, all of the experts that I've spoken to, is quite benign as, as herbicides and pesticides go. However, um, because GMO has become um, such an overarching boogeyman when it comes to the food system and all of the ills of our food system, which are which are totally real problems, um, it's glyphosate has almost become so, so toxic to the conversation about food, about farming, about uh, modern farming techniques and technology that um, it's almost it may in some ways, and I've heard some scientists say this who are aware of how benign glyphosate it, glyphosate excuse me is who are saying, hey, if we have to ban it and start from scratch and focus on um, genetic engineering traits and other crop traits with, um, that, we, uh, that we can create or improve using other techniques, uh, including but not limited to genetic engineering, if uh, getting rid of glyphosate can help us start fresh um, and avoid the mistakes that came with, with Monsanto and it's kind of, I mean, obviously shady past and sometimes shady present business practices, then it might be worth getting, glyphos get, getting rid of glyphosate, excuse me. And again, this isn't um, my opinion because I think it's, um, it's quite a, a nuanced opinion um, ne needs to be taken, but I've heard this uh, among many experts. It's a, it's a messy conversation, but it raises several crucial points um, when it comes to farming and food in general. Carrie Killen, before the break, you heard uh, what Nina Holland had to Can say. Can I make a little comment to that? Yes, go ahead, Nina Holland. Well, I mean, uh, no, no uh, expert or even the, or decision maker or regulator in the EU says that glyphosate is benign. It is uh, toxic, it kills all plant life, it is toxic to aquatic life, it's uh, toxic to soil life, uh, it's toxic to humans. Uh, the discussion here is about carcinogenity, uh, but nobody says that glyphosate is benign. And currently with the biodiversity crisis we are seeing, uh, people are more and more aware uh, of the wider impacts of, of, the, of the use of these kind of uh, broad spectrum herbicides. I just wanted to, to mention that. Yeah, and it it brings us to 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 the next point on on this matter. Again, I just I just need to make sure that I I make it clear that it's it's not benign because of course nothing is benign, but relative to other herbicides and some of the alternatives that we're talking about, I absolutely have heard a number of experts say that glyphosate is relatively benign compared to these, just to be clear. All right, Carrie Gillum, let me ask you, uh, because you heard François Veyret, you heard Nina Holland uh, 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 upon, uh, on, on this in part one of our discussion. Uh, you've looked at uh, what's been published and what's not been published. Tell us what you think. 
Right. There's a lot to unpack here. So I've been covering Monsanto since 1998. Um, that has been my job and my baby uh, to to get to know this industry and this chemical, the crops, the strategy, the science. That's what I've done for 20 years. And I do think it is nuanced. I think it is messy, as uh, Kevin said. So there are a few things here. Um, the Monsanto papers definitely have been very revelatory about Monsanto's deception. Um, when I talked to the European Parliament, I, I called it decades of deceit. We see very clearly that the company has not been forthright and transparent about the science, um, about the risks to human and environmental health, and that they have not been transparent, transparent or truthful with regard to their interactions with regulatory agencies in the United States and in Europe. So that's very clearly documented in a number of internal communications, and including how they worked really covertly through third parties to try to discredit the International Agency for Research on Cancer. So, you know, that is important. Now, if you set that aside and you look at glyphosate-based herbicides and the importance to farming and how that plays into the global debate about whether or not they should be banned, you know, there are many things there to consider. So, yes, Glyphosate-based formulations are shown to be more uh, safe than some other herbicides that have been used in the past. Um, you know, Paraquat, for example, much more harmful immediately uh, to people who are using it if they're exposed wrongly. So, yes, it's safer. However, one of the big problems is Monsanto has said for so long it is so safe. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to take precautions like you do with others. And what we've seen in the evidence is that's not true. You do need to be take precautions. You do need to wear protective gear. It does absorb into the skin. It can migrate to the bones. It can cause harmful impacts if you don't protect yourself. So the messaging has been off. Secondarily, the introduction of Roundup Ready crops and the practice of desiccating crops with glyphosate has led to just vast overuse of this chemical. And so what we're seeing now is it doesn't work as well as it used to. So farmers are using more and we're seeing soil uh, health decimation. We're seeing a loss of biodiversity. We're seeing, you know, this pesticide is so prevalent now, it's documented by US researchers in rainfall. We're leaving residues in our foods. It's found in our urine. So I see this as a problem of stewardship um, as well as deceptive science. You know, if, if glyphosate had been used in a more restrictive manner and people had been warned effectively of the risks uh, and we weren't, you know, pouring it over entire fields of Roundup Ready crops and desiccating wheat and oats, you know, it, it, there might be a different view right now. Um, so I, again, I don't know, I don't ever weigh in on ban or not ban. I'm not sure that, that that's the right conversation at this point. I think we need more responsibility, more accountability, and more truthfulness in, in our regulatory system and in the policy surrounding these chemicals and these companies. Yeah, the Monsanto papers uh, gave us a look into how regulation uh, works uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, they, those papers appeared in October 2017. It was only June of 2018, later, when Bayer bought Monsanto. And with the share price again plummeting this Tuesday, the company has now lost close to half of its value since uh, that takeover. No surprise then that when shareholders gathered, gathered two weeks ago in Bonn for their annual meeting, they asked CEO Werner Baumann well, for his head. One is a bit shocked, I need to say. When I buy a company, I know the risk, and I have my doubts if Mr. Bowman does. On the hashtag F24 debate, uh, Lars asking, why is Werner Baumann still CEO of Bayer? Bayer his stock hit $53 today, last seen in 2012. It's lost 46% in value since Monsanto was bought. Bayer now worth less than what they paid for Monsanto. Uh, better question, François Veyret, is why did Bayer buy Monsanto? I'm, I'm certainly not the best person to answer this question. But, well, I, I have the same question in mind, really. Everybody knew uh, a couple of years ago already that glyphosate was a strong suspect and that uh, Monsanto has a big record of dangerous uh, chemicals in its portfolio and, uh, and also a lack of transparency in his information. So I guess, yes, 
buyer took a, a big risk by buying Monsanto, but uh, it was in a period where all the chemical, agrochemical firms were trying to, to find allies to grow bigger, uh, as did other firms like Syngenta and, and so on. So uh, Monsanto was uh, maybe a last possible ally, a last possible big firm to, 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 to buy, to grow bigger, and they, they made the choice, but obviously it was not a good choice at all today, as this huge find, huge find we, we discovered uh, yesterday, two billion dollars plus, uh, well, uh, is going, going to jeopardize this firm because we, we have thousands of other cases coming ahead and uh, I'm deeply convinced that the verdicts of these other cases will be strictly the same. So it could, uh, yes, endanger this uh, German firm, really. It endangers the German firm and that is an opinion uh, shared by analysts on the other side of the Rhine who, uh, like Francois say, that uh, when Bayer bought Monsanto, again, it was in last year, they thought they had an opportunity. By taking over Monsanto, Bayer knew exactly what they were doing. They wanted to get bigger, but they bought a large reputation risk. The glyphosate issue is seen so negatively now that Bayer will always be associated with glyphosate. They have to end that. I even see the danger of Bayer's shares dropping so much that it will become a takeover target. So, Nina Holland, uh, here you have this race to be bigger, and that's also uh, weighing on uh, those regulators, which you were describing uh, are uh, mismatched uh, when they uh, try to police these giant corporations. Yes, exactly. And unfortunately, the EU does not have good rules in place to avoid these kind of mega mergers, which allow these kind of uh, enormously powerful corporations uh, to, to exist. I would like to stress that Bayer is not that different from Monsanto. I mean, of course, Monsanto was a huge reputational risk, but Bayer itself had been also pestered with scandals around their lobbying against the EU taking actions on hormone disrupting chemicals. Uh, the neonicotinoids, uh, the bee-killing pesticides, Bayer was taking the EU to court over uh, a partial ban on these uh, very d harmful products. So I think uh, Bayer itself had, has also uh, been showing itself uh, not from its, uh, from its best side here in, uh, in the EU. And uh, yeah, together uh, these, these corporations have a lot of power. Uh, Brussels is the biggest, is the lobbying capital, uh, the, the biggest in the world after Washington. There are uh, tens of thousands of lobbyists here every day uh, trying to influence decision makers. Uh, there's almost a lobbyist for every, uh, every official uh, here. And, um, and they have the, the resources, the financial resources for, to employ uh, a large number of people, but also uh, many different tactics. So they have the money to hire uh, uh, high-level politicians or decision makers. They go through the revolving doors. They have the money uh, for these kind of PR strategies the, the, to gather the kind of intelligence, and, 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 as we've been seeing with the Monsanto files uh, this week. To, I was yeah. going to say, uh, Nina, uh, do you think we're at a turning point now? Because we mentioned earlier uh, the diesel gate emission scandals with the auto industry. We're seeing how uh, in the United States all kinds of questions are being raised uh, over the cozy ties between Boeing and aviation authorities uh, uh, that uh, may have uh, played a factor in those uh, tragic uh, plane accidents we've seen. Do you think we're now at a turning point when it comes to the relationship yes. between regulators and corporations? Well, I would really hope so, because it's really high time. So far, the EU has not been wanting to put in place uh, any strict rules on lobbying. Uh, they simply uh, do not exist. There is a, a code of conduct that is very weak and that is not even being enforced. Uh, so rules uh, against unethical lobbying and, and lobbying that really um, is, is misleading. Uh, for instance, the organization, the setting up of front groups is a specialty of some of the lobby firms uh, here in Brussels, like Burson, Maas, Teller, Hill and Knowlton. Uh, they're all known for it. And uh, so what some political parties in France are now calling for is some kind of lobbying watchdog, uh, an official one uh, from the EU institutions to oversee uh, these kind of uh, excesses. Uh, 
and to basically uh, put some boundaries on, on corporate lobbying in, in Brussels. And I think that would be a really good thing. And I would really hope that in the EU elections this would become a major, uh, a major point of debate. Uh, Bayer, by the way, which has now apologized for revelations here in France that Monsanto kept uh, who's naughty and who's nice list. There were media, politicians, NGOs illegally listed according to their position on glyphosate, a PR whistleblower yeah. passing the documents the way of partner station France 2, among Can those on the list, that? former presidential candidate and environment minister Ségolène Royal. Let's take a listen. It's a very important discovery because it proves that there are objective strategies to destroy strong voices. I can see that they are trying to isolate me. Look, the president's adviser and the prime minister's adviser are identified and marked down as willing to change their mind. François Veyret, uh, are you on the list? Yes, I am. I am on the list with dozens and hundreds of people, journalists, politicians, uh, high-level civil servants. And uh, what is shocking is that there, is, there are some details on our addresses, contacts, but also on our opinions and on, on our level of engagement and opposition to Monsanto. So this is uh, a major shock in France. It, it raised a huge emotion here in, in the country. And uh, while well, dozens of uh, complaints were uh, filed, because we don't think this is normal at all. It is not acceptable to have this illegal for us. It's illegal use of private data, and especially data re relating to uh, our own opinions. And uh, it shows that, uh, you know, this firm with uh, the, the PR uh, allies, they organize a strategy throughout Europe to, uh, to know who was doing what, thinking what, what were the allies, what were the opponents, and to develop a strategy and try to influence at the highest degree because you have high-level politicians also in the, in the files, the, the, the public policies, which is absolutely unacceptable, because for us, uh, policies must serve the environment, the health of the people, uh, the interest of the largest number, and not only private interests. So we hope, and I think it's a ma major theme in the coming uh, European election, that we must have some control, a very efficient control of lobbies here in, in Brussels, but in every uh, national capital as well, to be sure that there is a fair relation between uh, various stakeholders and the politicians and the power in place, because this is absolutely out of balance. We are, for example, in NGOs, you have only a few people uh, working here in, in Brussels on pesticides, whereas we have hundreds of lobbyists uh, lobbying for various uh, pesticide firms. So. This is totally unbalanced, totally un abnormal, and this uh, fire business is uh, an absolute scandal in France. And I hope that there will be condemnations uh, around this affair. And once again, we invited Bayer to this uh, conversation. It's a Can shame I they did not they did not that? make it. Unfortunately, Nina Holland, we're out of time. So I want, but I want to thank you so much for joining us from Brussels. I want to thank François Veyret. I want to thank uh, Carrie Gillum in Kansas City and Kevin Senapati in Madison, Wisconsin. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So it's a lot of bad buzz uh, today for Monsanto and Bayer on, on, online, coming from many different angles. Do you own stock? <laughs> I don't, actually. Okay. I, 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 I've thrown out my roundup. But uh, I don't have a garden either, so... Uh, Nothing, nothing to spray. But uh, we do have... Uh, it is efficient, by the way. It is efficient. you got to wonder um, why. Right. But uh, <laughs> do, 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 perhaps best to avoid uh, eating some charcuterie and some uh, dry meats. I know meats. what you're about to say. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But just, just in a moment, um, first off, there's a lot of basically scientific uh, uh, kind of uh, studies going up online now uh, that, uh, that people are referencing via Twitter and whatever. The, the argument there's no science behind Roundup uh, or, 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 or pesticides like this being dangerous is on very shaky ground. You can see one uh, legal, uh, one lawyer here, Max uh, Kennerly, who's been following uh, the various trials in the US very closely, linking uh, to 
various different studies, Roundup causes a variety of cancers in mice. Uh, multiple studies found uh, genotoxicity in human cells. Roundup raises the risk of cancer, raises the risk of cancer in humans in a dose-dependent manner. So all of this is disastrous in terms of image for the company. Uh, also, just financially, uh, if you if you do the sums, buyers, uh, glyphosate liability is now 11,000 cases times 2 billion, which is 22 quadrillion dollars. To get an idea of how much money this is, find an astrophysicist. If they pay the full stop. Right, exactly. So look, because it's all going to go to appeals as well, but that could be financially absolutely ruinous. Uh, this is an article that goes back a couple of days, but again, showing uh, the, uh, the the degradation to the image of the, of, of the company and also the EPA in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, a lot of people feeling now that they can't be trusted agencies such as this. If what has been touted as perhaps our safest, widely used pesticide actually causes cancer, what assurance do we have about the hundreds of other pesticides that the EPA has assured us are safe? That's from an article a couple of days ago in The Guardian anticipating mm. the results of these cases. Now, just to get to what you were uh, talking to one guest about uh, initially, it, it, just before uh, the uh, the end of the show, uh, the fact that this is having a knock-on effect here in Europe because Bayer has been keeping track of, according to one Le Monde study, uh, personalities that have, might have a negative opinion about uh, about Bayer or Mons Monsanto products. So we, we can, even Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is um, an environmental lawyer, environmental uh, lawyer, exactly, is, is keeping a close eye on this. And the fact that Bayer has actually hired an external law firm to investigate this French media complaint so that they are taking that somewhat seriously. Now, that has generated a lot of reaction online. Delphine Bateau, who is uh, an ecolo ecolo ecology um, par uh, politician, former ecology minister indeed here in France, has been very vocal about this. All bearing in mind that this is in the lead up to European elections as well, so it's pl very politically charged. But she is accusing Monsanto of interference and said that it is absolutely disgraceful, uh, these revelations that they've been keeping files on politicians and what they sort of think. It's sort of a... Uh, it is quite concerning. Now, another piece of information that's emerging, this in La Dépêche du Midi, uh, a southern newspaper here in France, a leak regarding a, a parliamentary report that's due to come out on Thursday about the French position, uh, legal position on glyphosate. And it looks like, uh, according to that, uh, that, these leaks from one uh, senator, uh, Pierre uh, Medeviel, Medevielle, I hope that's pronounced correctly. Who, by the way, is a pharmacist, I'm told. Right. Well, interesting. <laughs> so his, his take, he, what he has been saying is... His what personal this, opinion. What this report is going to... Is going to essentially. Is that charcuterie include. is just as safe? Dried meats. Red meat right. is, in fact, some would even argue, more carcinogenic than Roundup. So, of course, that's generated lots of comment online, lots of lots of uh, cartoons as well. I'll just show you a couple. Uh, this one here sh is showing, uh, you know, a tractor uh, spraying sausages on crops. In other words, is it actually uh, as effective as, as Roundup? You've had various different. Uh, and then the flip side of that, people serving up. Uh, glyphosate soup in restaurants. Indeed, it is an un uncomfortable comparison. I mean, we tend to think of pesticides <laughs> and dried meats as poles apart, but apparently the science would, 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 would show that perhaps in terms According of carcinogenic to properties... According to him. Right, we'll have to see what the report says on Thursday. <laughs> All right, we'll be watching out for it. <laughs> Many thanks, thanks. Francois. James Greeden, thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.